If you read what the Greeks said, not what we think, but if you read what the Greeks said, they said they got everything from Egypt. They got all their knowledge from Egypt. The author Frank M. Snowden Jr. stated in his book, The Ethiopians in the Greco-Roman Experience, that the Africans who came to ancient Greece and Italy participated in an important chapter of classical history. But it wasn't just a participatory role. In fact, the Africans in Greece kick-started the whole Aegean civilization. In the early era, Minoans and Mycenaeans were considered the first high culture in Europe where none existed before. Unlike the ancient Egyptians, they were not predominantly black. But one thing is certain, it is that the whole Aegean civilization and all the hallmarks that we associate to it, from religion to writing, science, architecture, and philosophy, these pillars of Greek civilization were clearly seeded by Africans from the Nubio-Cometic civilization complex. And there is a plethora of evidence that shows this. Evidence not just from archaeology, but first accounts from the Greeks themselves who attest that their civilization was beholden to the Africans. Evidence that is well known by historians today, but seldom shared. While searching for the presence of African DNA in ancient civilization, you will come across statements like these, made in a BBC article about the origin of ancient Minoan and Mycenaean DNA. Quote, By contrast, the researchers found no evidence for proposed migrations to Greece from ancient Egypt or from the areas of the eastern Mediterranean occupied by the Phoenician seafaring culture. End quote. Well, here is the trouble with this statement. We already know that other DNA studies have shown a significant African presence in early Greek genetic makeup, a fact further validated by early Greek accounts, early Greek depictions in art and coins, and by clear cultural markers, all of them, elements that we will review today. It's important to note a distinction here. When we show that Greek civilization was seeded by black Africans, we are not saying that the Greek civilization was black. What we are demonstrating here is that their writing, culture, technology, science, and significant genetic seeding was black before it morphed into the Greek phenotype we are accustomed to today. It is a similar notion when we talk about the Egyptian and their Phoenicians colony, which later on seeded the beginnings of Carthage in North Africa, before it becomes a wholly African civilization a millennium later. In other words, the Africans from Kemet seeded the Phoenician colony, which was predominantly black and ruled by blacks until the Persian invasion in 500 BC. The Phoenicians, while the civilization was still black, went on to create many settlements in the Mediterranean, with their most successful being Carthage in North Africa, a black civilization with its star general Hannibal. Check out episode 11 where we cover Carthage and Hannibal. How do we know that the early seeding for Phoenician civilization was from the black Africans from the Nubio-Cometic civilization complex? Well, their writing, which dates from 1100 BC, is a direct derivative of hieratic, the cursive, more frequently used version of hieroglyphics. But more importantly, their gods were Egyptians' gods, and harbored Egyptian postures and phenotypes. See for yourself. In fact, you can Google early Phoenician god, and you are met with a picture of the chief deity Baal, a black African man, sporting a comedic pose. Even early Phoenician artifacts all the way in their Spanish settlements showed distinctively black African phenotypes. Like these terracotta heads that date back to 1100 BC, found in Gadir, the southwest of Spain. This is in the early period of the settlement. This piece is from the Museum of Kadir in Spain. Of particular interest here is the date, 1100 BC. Because often we are shown artifacts from the Phoenician period after the Persian invasion. So these images are rare gems that are consistent with the main fact. That Phoenicia was a derivative of Kemet, 
a colony that sported many of its culture, religion, and DNA. And you also have papers like this one, which discusses one of the many Phoenician sites in Ibiza where the mitochondrial DNA indicates a recent European maternal ancestry. But if you read on, they then reveal the true origin of the settlers, and I quote, Our data, while limited, suggests that the Eastern or North African influence in the Punic population of Ibiza was primarily male-dominated, end quote. And this fits in perfectly with the logic that the black men from Phoenicia went on their boats to colonize those sites and mated with the local women, European in Ibiza and black African in Carthage, modern-day Tunisia. These men left with their writing, technology, culture, and religion, and spread those elements as they went along. This is why it is important to go beyond the headlines of these articles and find out what they are really saying. And we need more black researchers in the field to help cover the large amount of scholarly articles on the subject and uncover further hidden truths of our collective history. But it wasn't just the Phoenician civilization that were seeded by the black Africans. The Greek civilization was also seeded by those same Africans and continuously influenced by them for more than a millennia. And there is plenty of evidence that shows this. In their 2002 paper on the genetic makeup of ancient Greece, the researchers, Arnaiz Vilena A. and Gomez Casado E., show that, quote, the population genetic relationships have been compared with the history of the classical populations living in the area. A revision of the historic postulates would have to be undertaken, particularly in the cases when genetics and history are overtly discordant. HLA Genomics shows that, one, Greeks share an important part of their genetic pool with Sub-Saharan Africans, Ethiopians and West Africans, also supported by CHIAR-7 markers. The gene flow from Black Africa to Greece may have occurred in pharaonic times, or when Saharan people emigrated after the present hyper-arid conditions were established, 5,000 years BC." End quote. But if indeed Greek civilization was seeded by Black Africans, then there must remain in the genetic record a significant genetic component that should be easily identifiable. And this is exactly what this next DNA study shows. Dr. Arnaiz Vilena, from the Biomolecular Department of the University of Complutense in Madrid, has discovered that Greeks do in fact share a significant genetic resemblance to sub-Saharan Africans, and that even more surprising, Greeks are closer genetically to Africans than they are to any other Mediterranean group. Let me repeat that. Even millennia after the seeding of Greece by the Africans from the Nubio-Cometic civilization, they remain genetically closer to sub-Saharan Africans than any other Mediterranean group. I will leave the links to the articles in the description so that you can read it for yourself. It has many other gems that the curious will find interesting. And yet, even though these studies are well known in the scientific community, you will not hear of this. On the contrary, we have continued cultural misrepresentation of what really transpired in history and the undeniable contribution of the Africans in the seeding of the first high culture in Europe. This is a knowledge and historical gap that we must address in order to mend the centuries of perceptual damage done to the African and to all those who uphold the truth in high esteem. And these studies are not unique. We have done a similar analysis in the genetic makeup of the ancient Egyptians. Don't miss it. It is in our episode 14. But if there is one element that is easily identifiable as the marker of a civilization seeding another, it is that of writing. And here too we have some interesting elements that show the hand of the African in establishing culture in the Aegean era. Cretan hieroglyphs associated with the Minoan civilization, the early days of the Greek civilization, represent an early writing system employed during the early to mid-second millennium BCE on the island of Crete. As one of the Minoans' undeciphered scripts, alongside Linear A, 
These hieroglyphs predominantly depict recognizable symbols and objects. It is posited that Cretan hieroglyphs emerged circa 2100 BCE and continued to be used until about 1700 BCE. Their primary application appears to have been in religious and administrative contexts, as evidenced by their frequent presence on seals and various administrative artifacts. Moreover, Cretan hieroglyphs are thought to be a potential precursor to Linear A, subsequently influencing the Mycenaean Linear B script. The Minoan's archaeological remains indicate a people that lived around settlements, centered around citadels that were defenseless. This indicates that they lived relatively peacefully, but also that their civilization was settled in key chosen areas, as opposed to having grown organically. Clear signs of another culture establishing religious and commercial centers in areas of their choosing. In their analysis of Cretan hieroglyphs, linguistic computing authors imply that the Cretan glyphs are related to pro-cuneiform. It could very well be, and if it is, it does not diminish the black origin of this writing system, because in 2100 BC, Mesopotamia was still very much so populated and ruled by black Africans. See our episode 7 and episode 10, but I wanted to point out an item that was completely missed in their analysis. The representations in figure 1 are easily identifiable by anyone who has studied ancient Egypt hieroglyphics. This is a cartouche, and it is undeniable. A cartouche is the ritualistic highlighting of a name to indicate that it is a pharaoh or a deity. In fact, when you see this in hieroglyphs, you can assume that enclosed is the name of a pharaoh. To see this representation here, in another civilization who also uses hieroglyphs, who borders Kemet, and was shown to be seated by Kemet, is beyond the realm of coincidences. But the Greek alphabet that we later on associate with the birth of Roman letters really derives from the Phoenician alphabet, as you can see from the table here. Take, for example, the letter H. We can trace its representation in the Greek alphabet, then further back in the Phoenician alphabet, and its representation in Linear B, the deciphered version of the early Greek alphabets. Researchers from the University of Nebraska also undertook a cladogram. This is phylogenetic analysis of the seven scripts shown in the table we just went over. And this is what they found. All seven scripts descend from a common ancestor. This means that the modern Greek alphabet, Phoenician, Arabic, Old Hungarian hieroglyphics and the earlier versions of Greek writing all come from the same source. And since the oldest amongst all of these is hieroglyphics, in 3300 BC in Africa, it is clear that these writing systems all derive from the African writing, Medu Necher, also called hieroglyphics. For more details on how the Phoenician alphabet is directly descended from hieroglyphics, you can see more articles in the video description, or reach out to me on Twitter. So if the Egyptians colonized all the regions around them to the north and east, why didn't they colonize south? And why wasn't their writing found deeper in the continent of Africa? Well, that question is based on a false premise that Africans did not have writing systems of their own and we will see how this is yet another widely spread misconception. Africa had innumerable writing systems, all of them not advertised, and here are a few. Meroitic script, influenced by Kemet, existed from about 300 BCE to 400 CE, used by the Meroitic civilization of the Kingdom of Kush in what is now Sudan. Gaez script, Demet, Ethiopian writing system, originated around the 9th to 5th century BCE, with roots in the ancient kingdom of Dumpt. It's an ancient Ethiopian script still used in the liturgy of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Proto-Saharan script, existed between 5000 and 3000 BC in the late phase of the desertification of the Sahara. It was found in use near the Karga Oasis in Nubia. Insibidi. Insibidi is an ancient script used to communicate in various languages in West and Central Africa most notably by the Uguacama and Ejigam people in Nigeria and Cameroon. It is believed to date back to 5000 BC, but the oldest archaeological evidence ever found dates it back to 2000 BC on the Icom monolith in Nigeria. Interestingly enough, it shares many characters with hieroglyphics. Adinkra symbols, 
a set of hieroglyphs from the Akan people of Ghana, widely used in wall writings, fabrics, and pottery, dating back to at least the early 18th century, each symbol carries a specific meaning. Great Zimbabwe hieroglyphics, dating back to the 11th century A.D., and discovered by early European explorers, they have sadly now been destroyed, along with multiple artifacts, in an effort by some misguided Europeans to hide the accomplishments of black Africans. When you study Great Zimbabwe, the similitudes to Nubio-Cometic culture are easily found. The Basa script, at least 500 B.C., from Liberia, West Africa. This is one of my all-time favorite scripts. The curved nature of the signs and originality of the glyphs always enchants me. These are only but a few of the multitude of writing systems that sprung up in Africa. Black Africans also left another imprint of their presence in early Greece, and it is one that survives till this day. If you are lucky enough to go to an ancient Greek museum today, you will notice the following, a surprising lack of depictions of black people, or almost no artifacts that depict black people in ancient Greek art. If you Google it, you cannot be blamed for thinking that black people had nothing to do with Greek civilization, but signs start to appear a few pages down into the search for the trained eye. This pose with the fists by the waist side and the left foot forward is none other than a pharaonic pose. It is prevalent in the archaic Greek period, but it had existed in Kemet for ages. But early Greek art is not just imitative of Kemetic art, it also depicts Africans in vast numbers. Take for example this ancient Minoan wall fresco, its art is distinctively Kemetic. The people depicted are also of the same hue as those on the wall paintings in Kemet, whom we have shown in our last episode sport typical black African DNA. Another fresco of Minoan young women carrying water jugs. Notice also the Egyptian-like attire. And again the insistence on Egyptian drawing conventions. Sideways while showing all limbs. Here, a Minoan religious ceremony with a priestess. You will notice that the ancient Greek knew how to depict different types of skin color and different types of hair. In this fresco, you can see that the men have distinctively different hair and hue than the priestess. So the often touted argument of women being painted in lighter color than men, out of convention, or because the men spent more time outside is dubious at best. In this other piece we have a fresco depicting a probable military detachment. This dates back to 1350 BC. There are also a large number of Greek coins that depict Africans. They are so numerous that they attest to the very large presence of black people throughout the different periods of Greek history. See for yourself. But beyond genetics, writing and depictions throughout this civilization, there is yet another indication that shows how Greece civilization was seeded by the Africans. Religion. Ancient Greek religion, so revered as one of the foundations of what would ultimately become the philosophical and moral underpinning of European society, is, when one looks at it, a Nubio-Kemetic religious philosophy. It is very surprising today to see that historians admit to Roman religion deriving directly from Greek religion, along with their gods, stories, myths, and religious tenets. But that same recognition is denied when talking about African religion vis-a-vis -vis Greek religion. And yet, this is what Herodotus himself, in the second volume of histories, said about the Greek gods. Quote, Almost all of the names of Greek gods came into Greece from Egypt, end quote. But let us look at other evidence that clearly shows that Kemet birthed Greek religion, and by translation Roman and European religion. Let's take for example the Greek concept of life and death forces, represented by the deity duo of Apollo and Dionysus, who appeared in 470 and 1300 BC, respectively. This is a concept that existed in Egypt already in 2300 BC. The Egyptians believed in balance in the universe, which was represented in the duopoly of their pantheon, 
Every god had its equivalent and opposite duo, and we see the same thing here again in the primary Greek gods. The Greek gods themselves are directly inherited from their nubio-cometic counterparts, and in many cases they were venerated in their black forms before becoming Europeanized. In the Greek epics both Zeus and his son were said to be black, but the king of gods sported a title that is undeniable. He had the title of Ethiop, meaning black. Even further, just like in the nubio-cometic civilization, Zeus had many appellations. This is similar to the African cultural practice to adorn a chief or a god with multiple adjectives and names, a practice that was very present in the nubio-cometic civilization complex. So Zeus himself, the chief deity in the Aegean pantheon, was said to be black and came directly from African pantheon. But he is not an exception. All Greek classical deities sport an equivalent Egyptian god. See for yourself. Zeus is a direct copy of Amun. Thanatos is the Egyptian Anubis. Apollo is Horus, god of prophecy and healing. Atlas is none other than Shu, the holder of the celestial sphere. Dionysius is a copy-paste of Osiris. And many more. However, there is one deity who became so popular, so beloved, that she transcended civilization borders and perjured through the millennia. And that is the Egyptian goddess Isis, the one who would become so venerated in the Greco-Roman world, morphing into multiple iterations. Her characteristic African depictions and pose, found from 2000 BC in Egypt, to these contemporary religious relics that people still pray to today, and to these gods, the Greeks built monuments, splendid architectural marvels that set the foundation for how Europe was going to build everything. And here again, both in architecture and building techniques, the Greeks took everything they knew from the Africans. The first Greek temple, the Temple of Athena Nike, was built in 427 BC. It uses the same architectural design patterns as the Temple of Djoser, built in 2670 BC, 2000 years before it. The pyramid and temple complex was architected by Imhotep, the father of medicine and architecture. The design was so innovative and the technology so enduring that 2000 years later the Greeks copied it. The Romans then learned it from the Greeks. This can be seen from the design motifs and the use of columns of the Greek temples. The Greeks and the Romans also inherited the practice of building with concrete, a science that the Egyptians discovered very early on. Even paved roads, this quintessential Roman civilization staple, was first used by the Africans in Kemet, then passed on to the Greeks and the black Etruscans who then gave everything they knew to the Roman. The oldest known paved road was found in the Lake Murus Quarry, and it dates back to the Old Kingdom period in ancient Egypt. And the same goes for pretty much all the major sciences and inventions attributed to the Greeks. That in fact came from the Africans. Here are a few. In mathematics, Pythagoras, theorem, fractions, geometry and trigonometry, decimal system, algebra, and so many more math concepts. If you want more details on these, See episode 12 in our channel on the origins of math. The Africans in Egypt single-handedly created the science of medicine as we know it today. Imhotep, yes, the same boy genius that built the first pyramid in Egypt, the Step Pyramid, was also the author of the first medical book in history in 2650 BC. Already the Africans could perform surgery, dental procedure with prosthetics, detailed diagnostics of diseases, including chronic diseases. And by the way, this is what Imhotep looked like, unmistakingly, black African, in all his depictions. Same goes with astrology and astronomy, again invented by the Africans and given to the Greeks and other civilizations. In fact, there are too many sciences to cite. We are talking here about a veritable cultural download that the Greek benefited from, so just like before we will leave sources in the video description for those who want to dig further. But there is yet another key element that the African colony in Greece benefited from, and this last element proved to be vital to modernization of the world. And it is synonymous with ancient Greece itself. A 
a researcher from the University of Lagos, Nicholas Anakwe, set out to analyze the possibility of Greek philosophy originating from ancient Egypt, and their findings are telling. And I quote, Given the entire trajectory of the whole argument put forward to examine the notion of Greek philosophy having its foundations in Africa, it appears evident that such an allegation is consistent with the body of evidence. They go on to state that, in conclusion, therefore, it is manifest that Greek philosophy can be reliably traced to African influences. Africa has never been alien to philosophical thinking and the rigors of the philosophical spirit. End quote. This very much so in line with the work of George G. M. James, who had concluded in his book, Stolen Legacy, that Greek philosophy is a rewrite of the mystery system in ancient Egypt, complete with African philosophy and scientific knowledge. But if this has any truth to it, then it would be easy to show that famous Greek philosophers only produced their key works, after they had spent time in Africa. Let's then revisit the most famous Greek philosophers and see if they have spent any time in Kemet. Thales of Miletus Considered the first philosopher in the Greek tradition, Thales is known for his work in geometry, astronomy, and natural philosophy. He is credited with numerous geometric theorems, including the concept that a circle is bisected by its diameter and various observations about the solstices and equinoxes. Thales spent considerable time in Egypt, after which he produced his body of work. Pythagoras of Samos Pythagoras is most famous for the Pythagorean theorem in geometry, but his influence extends to the realms of mathematics, music, and philosophy. His school thought deeply about numbers, the soul's immortality, and the universe's nature, contributing significantly to later mystical and philosophical thought. Pythagoras spent 15 years in Egypt before his prolific theorem. Plato Plato's work covers a broad range of subjects, including ethics, politics, metaphysics, and epistemology. His dialogues are his most famous contributions, exploring the ideas of justice, beauty, equality, and the soul, with The Republic, Timaeus, and Symposium among his most influential works. Plato spent almost two decades in Egypt and worked closely with Pythagoras. Eudoxus of Sinaitis Eudoxus is primarily known for his work in mathematics and astronomy. He is credited with the geometric model of the heavens, explaining planetary motions, and contributions to the theory of proportion and geometric series. He went to Egypt where he was taught astronomy by African priests in their observatories. Herodotus, known as the father of history, Herodotus wrote The Histories, a comprehensive account of the Greco-Persian Wars, and extensive ethnographic and cultural descriptions of the various peoples known to the Greek world. He traveled to Egypt in 454 BC, 30 years before writing his seminal volumes, The Histories. Herodotus studies Egyptian civilization thoroughly, Solon of Athens. As a statesman, lawmaker, and poet, Solon's work was primarily in the realm of politics and ethics. He is best known for his legal reforms in Athens, laying the foundations for Athenian democracy. In many ways taught to be the father of democracy. He spent a significant amount of time in Egypt. Democritus Democritus is best known for his atomic theory of the universe, proposing that everything is composed of indivisible units called atoms. His work spans topics in ethics, mathematics, and natural philosophy. In Maney's eyes, considered the father of atomic physics, and yet after his father died, Democritus took his inheritance and went to Nubia, where he studied mathematics. He produced his body of work after his travels to Egypt. Hecateus of Miletus As a geographer and historian, Hecateus wrote two major works, Genealogiae, Genealogies, a systematic account of the myths and legends of various nations, and a geographical survey of the known world. Again, he spent significant time in the Nubio-Kemetic civilization before he produced his work. Anaxagoras Anaxagoras is known for his cosmological theory, which includes the concept of nous, mind, as the original organizing principle. He made significant contributions to the understanding of the nature of matter, motion, and the celestial bodies. Same thing. And there are many more. But I think you get the picture. One quick note, 
the great majority of the paintings and sculptures of the famous Greek figures were not made until the Greek civilization had long ended, and many were made during the Renaissance era, more than a millennia later. If only one of them had traveled to Egypt at some point in their life, it could have been attributed to chance. But the fact that all those who we consider great Greek thinkers were in fact students of the African mystery system before they produced their work is beyond coincidence, in the same way that it is by no means a coincidence that the Greeks created the Olympic Games after witnessing the exact ceremony in Africa. Also beyond coincidence is the existence of theater play in Kemet, millennia before being adapted by the Greeks. Ancient Egyptian theater emerged from ritual practices, particularly centered around religious ceremonies like the Abydos Passion Play, dealing with the death and resurrection of Osiris. This was an elaborate spectacle involving mock battles, processions, and burial ceremonies. Performances often had religious significance, and were not theater in the modern sense, but were integral to their cultural and religious life. Perhaps it is no longer surprising that the Egyptian priests told Solon that the Greek civilization had been restarted many times by the Egyptians after they had collapsed. Viewed in this light, we can see Greece as a veritable colony of Kement that took millennia of civilization injection to flourish into the Greece we now know. And throughout all its period, it had not only taken its foundational elements from the Africans, but many of its key early figures were African. This is well spoken to by this piece from Mr. Imhotep. Danaeus is fleeing Africa because his brother Egyptus proposed a plan to marry his sons to Danaeus' daughters. But Danaeus refused and decided to flee to Argos to avoid a conflict. At the time, the plains of Argos were under the control of a people called Pelasgians, led by a man named Pelasgus. With the arrival of Danaeus, everything changed. He was quickly raised to the throne with the consent of the natives and introduced the people to the use of wells. He founded the city of Argos, which is also known by the Pelasgian name Larissa. And this is the story of the founding of Argos, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world and the oldest in Europe, located in Argolis, Peloponnese, Greece. Thus, according to Greek mythology, Argos was founded by an African man. Despite the curiosity surrounding this fact, it's actually a common narrative in ancient Greek mythology and history, as there was a real entanglement between ancient Greece and Africa. The Greek gods were often involved in affairs in Africa or called Africans themselves. Mr. Imhotep's channel is full of gems like this one, another one of those unsung heroes that is working to write the historical narrative and give Africans their proper place in our collective history. Do check out his channel. So then, one might ask, why is it that those who birthed civilization itself, today, find themselves in the most precarious of economic condition? And is this absence of economic success synonymous with an intellectual lacking from the Africans? If anything, the study of history disproves that. And in that statement lies the reasons why those with ill intentions have sought to hide these truths from African people, but especially from the unsuspecting non-black. Because how would one be able to justify his or her hatred when they realize how intertwined our histories are? It is the epitome of irony that history is saying that the trajectory of the modern world goes, not through the white, not through the black, but through both where one starts it and the other continues it. An inseparable story of ingenuity and triumph of the human mind over his and her environment, written in all our blood, still detectable in the veins of those who live at the intersection of Africa and Europe today, Greece. As to the question of why Africans today are so poor compared to other nations, although they benefited from the silt of the Nile and overflowed its knowledge to the rest of the world, well, by the time Kemet ended, the damage had already been done. We were already at peak deforestation of the Sahara. This veritable economic engine had dried up, taking along with it countless civilizations 
and creating a population collapse on the African continent, the likes of which has never been experienced. It is this disaster that Africa is recovering from till this day, and it is recovering quickly. If we want to be just to the current history, we have to say that Africans were in fact the first high cultures in Europe. From its early genetics to its science, religion, and philosophy, Africans seeded the Greek civilization and nurtured it for a thousand years before it could fly on its own. Don't miss our previous episode where we cover the endless gems found in the latest genetic studies of ancient Egypt, and the one before that where we cover how Africans invented the major math principles that we use today. I cannot thank the channel subscribers and channel supporters enough. It is thanks to you that I am able to do the research and editing needed to share our true history. To each his own ability, but if you can spare anything, I would be very grateful if you could become a Patreon member or channel member. Even those leaving a comment of appreciation or liking the video helps, and you all have my eternal gratitude. It is only through a diligent study of the past that one can perceive the mosaic of the self. Join us and see how those who are said to be without history birthed civilization itself. <laughs> 